The fifth game I covered on the channel, or in the Blind Forest, was one that could be classified as a Metroidvania, although it felt more like a side-scroller Zelda game above anything else. But what does it even mean to be a Metroidvania? Let's look at one of the games responsible for helping coin this definition, Metroid, or rather its superior remake, Metroid Zero Mission for the Game Boy Advance. And this game is more than just updated visuals and music. New areas, abilities, and bosses have been added. My reason for choosing Zero Mission over its NES counterpart was for two reasons. First, it's a much newer game that's not plagued by NES-era clunkiness and controls. And second, Zero Mission is more accessible to newcomers of the series, and therefore I knew I would have a much better experience with it. Although I've played Metrovanias like both Ori games and Hollow Knight, I've never actually completed a Metro title before, so this was somewhat new territory for me. It's a series that I've always wanted to get into, and I believe deserves more recognition and care from Nintendo. It looks like they managed to do that with the newest title, Metroid Dread, which is awesome to see. I actually own Dread with the physical collector's edition, but haven't loaded it up once. I plan on working my way up to it after completing the other games in the 2D series. I have a lot of respect for Metroid, and just the gameplay concept of an expanding world gated by power-ups for progression is something I can certainly get behind. For those interested in the series and think that they may want to give it a try, you really can't go wrong with Zero Mission. From personal experiences and from browsing the internet's most reliable source Reddit, it seems to be the general consensus that this is a great introduction into the series, and I highly recommend giving it a shot. So join me on my first journey into the Metroid series with Metroid Zero Mission, but played on an emulator because Nintendo is lame as sh**. I played Zero Mission on a 27 inch monitor and it looked shockingly good. The sprite work for the enemies all looks solid, Samus' power suit and its animations are all top notch, and the game's UI is very simple to understand. It's also really cool seeing different upgrades slightly altering Samus' appearance, with the various suit making Samus more orange, and the gravity suit overhauling Samus' color palette with purple and yellow. And while this may fit under the gameplay section, the game's UI and menus are all very clean and simple to use. The map screen is very clear and will detail where you are, where to go next, and if you've missed any items in previous areas. It's enough information to get you on the right track without making the game too easy. And for reminding yourself of Samus' abilities, the status tab shows you what abilities you've earned and how to use them. It's a nice way to remind players that may have taken a break from the game and needed some assistance getting readjusted to the controls. Even if this is unlikely since the game is already pretty short, it's a nice inclusion nonetheless. The game's music was always solid with iconic tracks like the main menu theme and the Brinstar Overworld theme. Honestly, each main area theme was pretty good, and they'll be what I use mainly as background music for this video, so you'll get to hear my favorite ones throughout. I do also appreciate how various upgrades in the game will slightly alter Samus' sound effects, such as a new sound when jumping with a screw attack, or additional effects added with each new beam upgrade. There are also short cutscenes in this game which usually involve static images moving across the screen, which I accept as a limitation of the GBA and don't mind them. They usually appear once you've reached some progression milestone, such as entering a new area or defeating a boss. As with the rest of the game, the pixel art all looks great and I have no complaints with the presentation. As I mentioned before, Metroid Zero Mission is a remake of the original NES title, but this also includes overriding the story of the original game in the timeline to replace it with Zero Mission's events. At least I think? I've seen various people online debating if this remake is canon, and it seems like even Nintendo themselves can't decide what's canon in the Metroid series. Therefore I won't be following anything religiously, and I'm adopting the viewpoint that Zero Mission is canon to replace the original NES game. I can't think of any other examples of video games where a remake has deleted its initial story from the canon. So to me, this is quite an interesting change. Samus' adventure begins with arriving on planet Zebes to exterminate Mother Brain for her so-called Zero Mission. Hey, that's the name of the show. Many of the game's story elements involve defeating Mother Brain's henchmen to eventually reach the mechanical monster herself. She has an encounter with her nemesis Ridley, the one responsible for killing her parents, and a robotic version dubbed Mecha Ridley for the final boss of the game. There's more to the story, particularly involving the Metroids themselves, the space pirates, and Samus' past relating to the Chozo race, but those aspects aren't as important to me for discussing in this video. I do like this story and I'm interested in seeing how it leads into the next game, but I'm mainly here for the gameplay so that's what we'll spend a majority of this video on. A significant part of the journey through Metroid games is the contrast of where you start compared to where you end. By the time you're gearing up to face the final boss in this game, you've traveled to hell and back fighting swarms of tough enemies that become nothing more than fodder by the end when fully decked out with every upgrade. That feeling of progression in these games in any video game of this type will continue to be an unparalleled experience, and it always works to positively empower the player. Every item picked up is like opening a new present at Christmas to see what new possibilities you've unlocked. Metroid Zero Mission excels at keeping a steady stream of new abilities to keep players engaged without any long stretches devoid of significant upgrades to earn. Immediately after gaining control of Samus, you're granted the Morph Ball, and it just keeps going from there. By the time you exit Brinstar, the first main area, you've already collected 4 upgrades all within 30 minutes going at a casual pace. While the rate at which upgrades are collected does diminish over time, there are still a sizable number of new abilities being added to Samus' arsenal. 
which thankfully are handled in the best way possible by the smart control scheme. The controls in this game are as sharp as ever, feeling pretty close to perfect. Jumping and shooting are signed to the A and B buttons, directional lock-on is on the left trigger, and toggling missiles as an alternate fire option is controlled by the right trigger. It's a very comfortable game to play, and the controls rarely feel cumbersome to use. Even from the start, Samus' movement feels pretty good, and only improves as you explore more of the world for new abilities. Unlocking newer upgrades will replace the originals, which is acceptable since they are never a side grade and only improve the current item. For example, each beam and suit upgrade only makes you more powerful, whereas something like the Metroid Prime games on the GameCube have multiple beams to choose from that perform different functions. This makes it much easier to manage all the abilities you unlock without having to fumble through menus or use additional inputs to switch between them, which suits the GBA's minimal number of buttons available. The only required item switching is changing which type of missile and morph ball bomb to use, achieved entirely with one press of the select button. This kept new upgrades very simple to understand how they function, and there were never any big learning curves when unlocking these besides for the speed booster. However, that item alone has so much to discuss that I'll save it for its own section later. My only major complaint with the controls is the lack of a dedicated button for entering the morph ball. Navigating Planet Zebus requires a lot of entering and exiting the morph ball, so much so that I'd go as far as to call it the most used ability in the game. I don't have a problem with this design choice, but rather I consider the need to double tap down every time you want to enter the morph ball to be poorly implemented. It can feel very slow and clunky sometimes if you're constantly exiting and entering small passageways, especially for some tight platforming where you need to quickly exit the morph ball to full height to grab a ledge. This also sucks in combat where you may be chased through a tunnel and need to quickly exit to stand up and begin shooting, which in most cases will get you hit. It was way too often that I found myself accidentally entering the morph ball because I wanted to crouch or I was trying to move around in a tense situation and I misclicked. Sure, this could be an issue created by me being inexperienced with the game, but my god was it frustrating. This problem became the worst thing ever conceived by the country of Japan against one particular enemy, the Metroids. I want to save this for my discussion about Turian later, but man did I want to throw my controller during that awful area. Another problem that I had, specifically with the physics, is the knockback and hit stun from taking damage. When you're on a small platform and you take damage, it is very likely that you'll be knocked off this platform. And not only this, but taking a hit will prevent you from doing anything for a short period of time, probably around a few frames. This includes grabbing platforms, shooting your beam, and cutting all momentum off. Getting hit negates anything and everything you were in the process of doing, as though you've activated Gold Experience Requiem, and you can be knocked into hits done while grabbing a ledge to kick you off of that. I don't think this is an inherently bad design choice, but in rooms with several projectiles coming towards you all at once, you just get constantly ping-ponged around like a ragdoll, unable to do anything to recover. This alone makes some sections of the game a complete nightmare, but in normal gameplay, getting hit just knocks you backwards slightly and you keep going without much of an interruption. Case in point, this thought never occurred to me while running around Brinstar for the first time, but as the platforming challenges began to require more precise jumps onto small platforms with enemies shooting at you, this issue that had been originally looming in the background began to really hinder my experience. When I played Metroid Zero Mission for this review, I stuck to the intended route designed by the developers in my playthroughs since that's usually how I prefer to play games. However, via various sequence breaking methods, you can earn certain items or defeat specific bosses out of order. These strategies are often used to keep these games feeling fresh in each run, and it's something quite unique to the genre that I have to give credit to. They're also frequently used in speedruns as you might expect. For example, you can earn the Various Suit or the Screw Attack upgrades much earlier than intended, which accelerates your playthrough speed significantly. The tricks for these are often quite difficult to pull off, so any players in speedruns that can get these consistently every time have my respect. Meanwhile, I'm spending 20 minutes to get one Shine Spark correct. My final and longest thoughts about the general gameplay of Metroid Zero Mission involved the journey to 100% completion. Because while there are many upgrades to discover throughout the game, that's not what a bulk of the final completion total will be. That 100% actually refers to 100 item pickups in the game, most of which comprise of additional missile and energy tanks. There are a total of 50 missile tank expansions to collect in this game, and that's just plain missiles. There are also 15 super missile tanks, 12 energy tanks, and 9 power bomb tanks to find on top of the 14 core upgrades to Samus. These result in grand totals of 250 missiles, 1,299 health, 30 super missiles, and an awful 18 power bombs. Why couldn't there be just one more pickup to make it 20? Are you trying to upset me? Besides for these energy tanks, these upgrades all add less to your overall storage when playing on hard mode, which is a crazy restriction to me. 250 missiles on normal mode is unnecessary, but only 100 on hard is barely enough for some fights. It also bothers me that a few of these minuscule increases to item capacities are hidden behind some truly devious shine spark puzzles. Shine sparking is a technique used to store the charge activated by the speed booster ability to use it somewhere else, and is required for reaching 100%.
I had no idea this existed on my first playthrough of the game, and it was only through additional searching online that I discovered the mechanic and wondered why it wasn't taught or even hinted to in-game. I came across a few inaccessible areas that seemed out of my reach even at the end of the game since I didn't know about Shines Barking, and it would have been nice to be informed about that in-game. I'm not sure how anyone could have discovered this ability without it being an accident. This alone is what prompted me to do a second playthrough with the sole purpose of seeing that 100% on my completion screen, which I did thankfully achieve. And believe me when I say that this game has you doing some insane shit with Shines Barking. Just to learn how to activate this took me 30 minutes, and I still didn't feel too comfortable with it. Then we get to a few of these puzzles that had me scratching my head to understand how they work. Probably the most infamous example that sticks in my mind is one energy tank in Chozodia that has you transferring the Shine Spark charge up a vertical shaft, through a room, down another shaft, and later triggering it after a long drop. You have to reset your charge, count it, one, two, three, four, five times just for an energy tank. It was downright absurd, and took me 20 minutes of trying over and over again. Now don't get me wrong, I was ecstatic when I finally got this done and I had me cheering silently at 2am. But you're telling me this is equivalent to bomb jumping up to a ceiling for the same reward? Now that is a little bullshit. I had to research and watch YouTube videos to learn an entirely new mechanic in the game for this energy tank, and yet there's another one just laying out in the open waiting to be picked up. Fuck off. Even besides for the insane shine sparking setups, there were some rooms that just had obnoxious puzzles to complete. It made me grow to hate how some of the booster setups required you to run between the rooms, or how some rooms needed to be reset if you fail a puzzle. Like for this energy tank right before the final boss room, how whenever you trigger the alarm you have to kill the enemies that spawn, leave the room, wind up a speed booster to destroy these blocks, and only then can you reattempt this horrendous space jump sequence. I was here for almost 40 minutes before I looked it up online and watched someone complete it using a shine spark instead which I then got after 5 minutes. Uh. And this brings up two more problems with going for 100% completion. Firstly, there are a few item pickups that are only accessible using the power bombs, an upgrade you get quite literally at the end of the game. Therefore, you are required to do a run through the entire map one more time after earning these, and man, did that drag down what was already a somewhat tedious endeavor. I was pumped to finish the game, just to be forced into another world tour of Planet Zebes. And secondly, what reasoning do you have for picking up all these items? Absolutely nothing! You spend all this time grabbing collectibles just to have no use for them. Sure, you have the final boss fight that you can enjoy never running out of ammo for, but that's it. Also, for some weird reason, apparently this boss fight is more difficult if you've picked up every item in the game before starting it, meaning that he has more health and does way more damage to you? Why? Speedrunners avoid this by collecting all but a couple items before the fight, then scooping up the final ones during the timed escape sequence that follows it. This is such a weird inclusion, but I didn't even realize the difference on my second playthrough, because I just remembered him being a really stupid boss and chalked it up to that. That concludes all of my general thoughts about the game. I still have three aspects to talk about though. The individual main upgrades found in the game, the areas you explore, and the bosses. The first two I'll talk about in depth next, but every boss in the game is basically the same. They do an attack that you dodge, then you pummel them with missiles. The giant centipede and Brinstar, the acid worm and Kraid, Kraid himself, Ridley, Mother Brain, and Mecha Ridley all follow this procedure, so I would just be repeating myself multiple times if I talked about each one. None of them stand out as good, and they feel like an afterthought sometimes. Therefore, let's move on to the other two more interesting discussions. Planet Zebus has seven main areas that you'll explore during your adventure. Zero Mission begins with Samus being lowered into the starting area of the game, Brinstar, a regular system of caves with basic enemies and simple platforming challenges. You pick up a handful of items here and fight the first of a few mini bosses in the world. It has a simple layout and is good for getting used to the controls. The second area you encounter, Norfair, is a series of volcanic caverns and intense heat, only mediated by additional power suit upgrades acquired later in the game. This is the first location where environmental hazards begin appearing often, and it's an effective way to up the ante of exploration. There's plenty of tight platforming on small, one block wide pillars in this area, and you'll need to be very precise to land these jumps and avoid falling into the lava below for big damage against yourself. Your first venture into these molten caves are done solely to reach criteria, meaning you arrive here only to leave immediately after. So basically Norfair is like the Ohio of Planet Zibis. You'll make your return to Norfair two more times later on with additional upgrades to allow for further exploration. But I will mention my main problem with this area now and why it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. The level design of Norfair is effectively split up into a top and bottom half, and you can only move between these segments through one vertical room on the right side of the area. It's very tedious just trying to get from the top of Norfair to the bottom, since you're required to walk through several long rooms of monotonous platforming and annoying enemies. And the right side vertical room isn't even quick to traverse either. 
Several pieces of the floor can only be broken up with the speed booster, which forces you to travel to an adjacent room just to charge up the booster and break a few blocks. You are required to do this twice every time you want to pass through Norfair to the bottom. Doing this the first time is alright, but if you're backtracking a lot through this game like I was while trying to get 100%, it's a real pain in the ass. After leaving Ohio, you take a short jaunt into Criteria, a partially outdoor area with tall mountains and ancient Chozo ruins to explore. It's the second smallest area in the game, only being beaten by the brief section dedicated to the Mother Brain fight. We'll get to that bullshit later. It's a basic area with not much to note, other than the ancient Chozo structures looking cool. The next large area that you'll be spending time exploring is Kraid, which is a strange name since it's just the lair of the dude that resides there also named Kraid, but I digress. This area looks more like alien architecture than caverns, which is a nice change in setting. It's laid out so much more vertically than something like Brinstar, which stretches out far horizontally, so it isn't too difficult to navigate. However, a majority of Kraid is initially unavailable due to one of its central mechanics, the zip lines, not having power. These machines will grab and pull you across a long distance, typically over large pits of lava or acid, and for most of the game this will be your only means of travel in some rooms. Your main tasks in Kraid will be to find the power stations for these ziplines to get them up and running again, which is done pretty quickly by following a certain pathway from the first room of the area, and to kill the main missile sponge boss here, also named Kraid. Next up is Ridley, another area that's weirdly named after the boss residing there. There isn't much of note in this place, it's more alien architecture with lava filled passageways, and another missile dumpster of a boss fight that dies in 45 seconds. To be honest, I don't remember much of significance in this area, and I just finished the game a little over a week ago. After defeating Ridley and picking up the screw attack, you're on to the worst area in the game, Turian. This is the smallest area as well, and is home to not only the worst enemies in the game, but also the worst boss, which I've been waiting nearly 30 minutes to complain about. The Metroids by themselves aren't too bad, and are easily dispatched by freezing them and unloading 5 missiles. If you are caught by them, they'll attach to you and suck away your life energy, only negated by entering the Morph Ball and dropping a bomb on them. This will knock them away temporarily for another chance to land the killing blow. Now this doesn't sound too awful, so why do they suck so much? Well let's see what happens when two appear at once. The Metroids will gravitate towards you like flies on shit, bouncing off of each other until one grabs onto you. The annoying part is trying to freeze both Metroids to handle one at a time, and they'll constantly get in the way of each other to block you from hitting both. So you're trying to juggle giving yourself an opportunity to attack these guys while shooting the one that's frozen while being pursued by the other. Plus these enemies do not stay frozen for long, so you better be fast to kill them. And god forbid you get hit by one, as I didn't mention one specific aspect of these enemies yet. When you bomb them to get off of you, you have to wait a short time before standing up or the Metroid will immediately exit its hit stun and magnet back to you again due to the hitboxes being close enough. So when you're knocking one Metroid off of you to stand up and freeze it, the other one will be waiting eagerly to attack you like it hasn't eaten since Jesus walked the earth. This is the root cause of my complaint about no dedicated morph ball, because getting ping-ponged between multiple metroids almost made me quit on my first playthrough. It was so infuriating. I hope whoever designed these enemies stubs their toe very, very hard. After getting through the metroids, you reach the end goal of this adventure and confront Mother Brain. This section wasn't as bad on my second playthrough because I understood how good super missiles actually are, and I had been collecting more item expansions before entering Turian. However, I am still not forgiving the sins committed in this final room. This section combines everything I've hated about this game and rolls it into one cesspool of shit. You've got your small platforms that you'll likely get knocked off of due to hit stun from every single attack in your way. You've got projectile spam that constantly staggers and stuns you from damage. You've got a spongy boss to dump missiles into just like every other boss in the game. And you have acid pits below the platforms that are extremely annoying to deal with since they slow you down and restrict movement. And you have to deal with a ledge grab that sometimes does not want to cooperate with you, all while still being shot at by enemies constantly. During my first playthrough of Zero Mission, I had to leave the area because I didn't have enough energy and missile tanks to both survive the constant damage and output enough to kill Mother Brain. The game up to this point never had such a demanding task for you to overcome, and this difficulty spike came out of absolutely nowhere. I hate it so much. Thankfully, after completing this fight, the falling escape sequence to your ship is pretty easy, so I never had to repeat this dreadful section. The final massive area, and I really do mean massive, is Chozodia. This place is goddamn huge, encompassing the space pirate mothership and the full Chozo ruins beyond what was featured in Criteria. You end up here after defeating Mother Brain and initially explore this section as Zero Suit Samus after having your ship shot down. All of the rooms are claustrophobic and tightly packed together, with a high density of space pirate enemies throughout. And your first venture here sees you powerless without any of your upgrades, leaving only a crappy little blaster that can temporarily stun enemies. I've seen mixed thoughts about this escape sequence, with some people saying that it's a great moment of panic before being gifted your final upgrades to make you unstoppable, and others feeling like it ruins the pacing of the game and is very unnecessary. I'm in agreement with the first group, as it's a welcome shakeup to the gameplay, and nothing fills me with more joy than struggling through a tough section for an amazing reward. When you're given those final abilities and the triumphant music starts playing in the background, you know you're in for a real treat.
Space Pirates change from a threatening enemy that cannot be escaped to one that you roll over with ease with your new Plasma Beam. It's one final hurrah before you face the final boss. Doing a short victory lap to use what you've learned before and take advantage of your newfound powers, you race to the bridge of the Space Pirate Mothership and destroy Mecha Ridley, triggering the game's ending escape sequence. This section is not very hard, and for some reason the game felt the need to throw two tanky regular enemies in the last room before your escape ship. Also, I'm pretty sure it's the only mandatory usage for the power bombs, the most useless upgrade in the game. I'm not sure why either of these things were included, it's truly baffling. But that doesn't matter because the game is officially done and you can relax as you watch your cutscene of blowing up this area of Planet Zibis. And with every area discussed, let's switch over to the abilities. There are 14 main upgrades to find in Planet Zebes. Metroid Zero Mission begins with Samus being lowered into Brinstar, where upon walking left you find the Morph Ball power-up, a Metroid series staple for accessing all of the small areas and pathways. As I began exploring this new alien environment, I initially found Samus' weapon to be somewhat weak compared to what I expected, but this was quickly remedied by obtaining the Long Beam to extend the range of her arm cannon shots. Instead of moving only a fraction of the screen length, they now extend to the entire screen, which is very handy. Later you find the most important tool for combat in this game, missiles. A handful of enemies in this game can only be damaged via missiles, and a majority of the secrets in this game reward additional missile tanks, so yeah, they're pretty good. They're also used for opening certain red doors to gain progression, and as I've mentioned before, basically every boss is just a missile vacuum since it's the only way to damage them, so it's important to gather lots of missile tanks. I'm honestly not sure why the game is so hell-bent on missiles being the only method of killing bosses. It's pretty ridiculous and undermines the beam upgrades to make them feel less significant. Killing the first mini-boss in Brinstar drops a power-up that I hardly found myself using, the Charge Beam. I always found it both faster and more convenient to unload dozens of missile tanks on enemies, since holding the charge isn't always easy to do in the heat of combat. It works perfectly fine, but it doesn't fit well with my playstyle in this game. The last upgrade you'll pick up in Brinstar is an upgrade to the Morph Ball, Bombs. These bombs initially serve the main purpose of additional traversal options, allowing you to bomb jump in small corridors and destroy blocks in your way. These bomb jumps are also one of the few ways that sequence breaking can be achieved in Zero Mission, and it'll be necessary for some missile and energy tanks throughout the world. However, you'll soon learn of a more tedious way that these bombs will need to be used, secret hunting. Beginning in the mid-game and continuing all the way until you finish the game, you'll be dropping bombs everywhere to identify hidden tiles that require certain upgrades to destroy such as a screw attack or missiles. These only become visible if you hit them with a morph ball bomb or by nuking the screen with a super bomb later. I don't really like that you're just forced to drop bombs everywhere in the world to find secrets, and it feels like the final beam upgrade should have at least had the courtesy of revealing these secret blocks. And you're telling me that some poor bastard went around the entire map dropping bombs to find every hidden block? Cause that is absurd. This is consistent with my earlier point about how annoying it is to not have a dedicated button for entering the morph ball, because this constant need for bombing does not make it any better. Following the genocide of several skeleton fish and wading through some water and criteria, you find the first unknown item, which allows some specially marked blocks to be destroyed. This item will later turn into the plasma beam upgrade, which will be discussed later. I actually like the implementation of the three unknown abilities, as by the time I reached the end of the game I forgot that I ever collected them, so it was an awesome surprise to be reminded just what you've been carrying around the whole game, albeit in an unusable state until the end. Shortly after you'll acquire the power grip, an extremely helpful item for saving yourself from a jump that's just barely too short as well as scaling large vertical chambers. However, sometimes it feels like the game can incorporate this too often into the platforming of certain screens, which affects the flow of the game after a while. If the platforming consists of jumping from ledge to ledge in a horizontal hallway, it can get pretty monotonous grabbing and mounting up each one. I noticed this a lot specifically in Norfair, and it really dragged down what would have otherwise been a pretty cool area. It feels less kinetic than it should, and it's something I hope improves with the next 2D games, which I have yet to play. I do like the power grip, and I think it's an essential part of the Zero Mission moveset, but they just use it way too much and it slows the game down more than it should. Then you return to Norfair with your new abilities and make your way to the Ice Beam, and holy shit is this upgrade amazing! It adds a whole new dynamic to platforming and even combat in some cases, with new opportunities brought up by being able to freeze enemies. With the right spacing, you can completely zone fast enemies from reaching you, and it's very satisfying. Plus, this freezing doubles as a platform maker, which is a neat concept used for a few secrets and to travel up some vertical rooms. I didn't know I needed this until I found it, but man, it was a pleasant surprise. Before defeating Crate, you find the next unknown item, which will later reveal itself as the Space Jump Boots. Then after defeating Crate, you're rewarded with the Speed Booster. This is a much more situationally dependent ability that looks both awesome and feels great to pull off. After running uninterrupted for long enough in a single direction, Samus will enter her speed boost state that will destroy everything in her path. The booster is incorporated into the environment through specific blocks that can only be broken while making contact with them in the boost state. Getting into the state isn't always easy, since not many rooms provide a runway for Samus to begin takeoff. You unfortunately can't go immediately from 0 to 100 since Samus needs time to build up the charge. And yes, I'm referencing kilometers per hour because I'm Canadian and the Imperial system is garbage. But you'll need both some of your own creativity and cooperation with the level design to trigger it. I originally thought that the speed booster was very underused, but that was before Shine Sparking entered the chat. 
Returning to Norfair with the power of BOOST grants access to the high jump boots, allowing Samus to jump higher and maintain longer airtime. Since these boots also allow for morph ball jumps, it further enables shine sparking in morph ball mode. Then returning to Brinstar with the high jump boots makes the first suit upgrade accessible. The various suit provides additional resistance to lava and other various environmental hazards, as well as increased defense against enemy attacks. It also makes Samus orange, which is a nice change to the suit color to indicate how much stronger you've gotten throughout your journey. The immunity to heat allows for further exploration of Norfair, which is necessary for yet another upgrade, the Wave Beam. This is a more powerful beam that passes through solid objects with a larger shot spread to cover more space in front of you. This upgrade makes Samus borderline unstoppable and oh my god did I love finding it for the first time. When you first reach the Ridley area, you fight a quick mini boss to receive the super missiles. These are just better versions of the normal missiles, dealing lots of damage and allowing green doors to be opened. No complaints here. After defeating Ridley and traveling through some hidden tunnels, you unlock the screw attack, and it's probably the most unique tool to Samus' moveset besides for the morph ball. With the screw attack, you can make yourself invulnerable while spinning in the air while also killing most basic enemies on contact. It's an excellent ability for quickly traversing through screens full of enemies, and you really can't go wrong with it. At the end of the long stealth section following the defeat of Mother Brain, you encounter the Chozo Warrior boss in Chozodia. This is a quick fight that requires you to shoot an orb when it begins to glow, very short and simple. Defeating this boss grants you back your power suit, and the three unknown items collected throughout the game manifest themselves as three new power-ups. The Plasma Beam is an absurdly powerful beam upgrade that shreds everything, the Space Jump enables an infinite screw attack in the air for unlimited airtime with the correct technique, and the Gravity Suit increases Samus' defense, making her invulnerable to all environmental hazards like acid. And it makes you purple! Receiving these final power-ups truly makes Samus an unstoppable force, which you will proceed to unleash upon the space pirates as you make your escape from captivity. This is all great stuff, but man, I was never able to get this space jump to work properly. I tried to watch YouTube videos of people truly using this ability infinitely, but I could never get it. It was especially annoying when trying to get the final energy tank near Mecha Ridley. So yeah, maybe I'm just bad, but the space jump just refused to work sometimes, and it was very annoying. And we finally reached the end. But not actually, since just like the game tricks you into thinking at the end, there was one more upgrade shoehorned in for no reason, the power bombs. There is no reason for this upgrade to exist in the game, and it's only used for one mandatory spot in the final escape sequence, and affords you to literally re-explore the entire map one more time to get the remaining item expansions hidden behind special power bomb blocks. This item solely exists to waste your time, and it's not even usable in the final boss itself since it doesn't deal any damage to Mecha Ridley. And now I've wasted your time talking about it. Thanks, Nintendo. And at long last, I have finished talking about the gameplay. I discussed my general thoughts about the controls, the physics, the journey to 100%, the art of shine sparking, then followed it with more specific thoughts about some bosses, each area in the game, and each of the main power-ups found across the world. I talked way longer than I thought I would about it, and I'm ready to wrap things up now. I hope people that watch this video don't get the wrong impression with how I feel about Metroid Zero Mission. All of my criticism comes out of a place of care and respect for this game, as it was a fantastic introduction to the series for me, and I think back very fondly to my first playthrough in 2021. This game is far from perfect, but exploring this vast world and uncovering all of the new upgrades kept me going until the end. I had such a good time, in fact, that not only did I do a second playthrough, but I collected 100% of the items in the game too. I learned Shine Sparking just to see that 3 digit number on my screen, and goddammit was it rewarding to witness it with my own eyes. The next Metroid game will be a big adjustment since it was released for the original Game Boy, and that's the version I intend to play for my next adventure into the series. Hopefully if you've enjoyed this video, then I'll see you around for whenever I make that one too. But I have so many other games to talk about that I have no idea when that may be. Regardless, for this video in particular, thank you for sticking around until the end. I truly didn't expect for it to be this long, but I just kept on writing more things about it and I continued to grow beyond the original scope. However, I don't have any issue with that, and I hope that I covered this game in a thorough and unique way. Metroid Zero Mission was a pretty good time, and there's a good chance that I'll play it again sometime this year, but I'm sure as hell not getting 100% completion. Thank you for watching. Since these boots also allow for the morph ball jump to ball, what the fuck did I just say?